Well, I think that uh, diplomats are, in, in many ways, the eyes and ears of the United States government overseas, and not only in the relationship with the government, but also in relationship to people in these countries. And in most countries, particularly in the developing world, the only American many people meet is the, the American diplomatic staff in an embassy. So there's both relating to these people overseas and reporting back to Washington on what the conditions are. Well, I, I, I actually don't think the risk was something that we were very concerned about in a, a sort of adverse way. I had the opportunity, as I think you know, to be in Somalia at the time that the American forces came in in December 92 to relieve the famine crisis. And in addition to the 12 or 13,000 military, there were about 20 or 30 civilians under Ambassador Robert Oakley. And we worked very well together. And I very much remember Ambassador Oakley's attitude, which was he wanted to demonstrate to the people of Somalia that he was confident the country would revive and so on. So we went around a lot and we saw people. Uh, and so th there were certain risks, but I don't think we focused on them as much as uh, you might think from the outside. Well, uh, particularly the attack in Nairobi when uh, Prue Bushnell was the ambassador was a, a terrible act in which I mean, a very large number of Kenyans as well as a certain number of Americans died. Many more Kenyans died than Americans. This was right in the heart of Nairobi. And uh, the State Department had not really provided her with adequate security. She had asked for more support to strengthen the embassy's perimeter and so on. And this was, for various reasons, never provided. The embassy is now kind of halfway out of town. And th that actually is a kind of uh, one of these uh, contrasts between being a diplomat and being open to the public and having security and not being open to the public. And I think this is an issue that remains to be addressed because you cannot run a diplomatic mission and have it be a fort. Well, I think uh, that, uh, with all respect, diplomatic security cannot be the only ones to make these decisions. Uh, the ambassador and the country team have to have a voice in how the embassy will function. So there has to be some kind of meeting of the minds. We, we have to be open to the public as an embassy, as an ambassador. Otherwise, you know, there's no point in being there. Well, when I went to, uh, I must say again, I didn't think about these things in quite these terms. It was really when you go there, you're there because you want to be there and you are ready to do this. And in fact, when I went up to Somalia the second time the, when we were trying the U.S. to relieve the famine crisis, it turned out to be one of the highlights of my career. Uh, and there was a lot of... Uh, feeling that we were working together and we were trying to help the Somali people in a positive way and even though things later on didn't work out this was not a total failure or something. Um, my wife stayed behind in South Africa later on when I went to Sierra Leone she stayed behind in New York. Um, you know families with children I think take these problems greater difficulty. Uh, you know, we, we, we just sort of juggled our two careers. Well, it was not, not immediately about Charles Taylor. Uh, the, um, I went in 1995, and in 1996 was the first free, election, free and fair election in over 30 years in the country, which I supported strongly by meeting with human rights groups, civil society groups, and so on, lending my support and through myself, through the U.S. support for this election. And that election actually was a, a success. And so it was a peaceful election and it brought President uh, Ahmed Tejan Kaba to power. Fourteen months later there was a coup, as you may know, and he had to leave for seven, eight months to go to Guinea. And again, the United States and myself, but also the U.S. government really 
pushed hard to uh, promote the withdrawal of the Revolutionary United Front and the uh, junior army officers from control in Freetown and bringing the elected government back. So this was a joint effort by the leaders of ECOWAS, the economic community of West African states. But uh, representing the United States, I supported this all very strongly by my presence and by my efforts to promote that return of the elected president. The Taylor story came up later. I was no longer there. And, uh, but again, I think the United States played an important role in pressing first uh, uh, then uh, President uh, Ellen Sirleaf Johnson to in turn press President Obasanjo to have Taylor, who was at that time in Nigeria, apprehended and arrested, which happened, as you know. And then he was returned at the first to Freetown and later to The Hague. So I think this is a really important event that has happened, that he's been convicted of these crimes in Sierra Leone, and I think he was very responsible. Well, I, I think certainly in uh, South Africa, where I had been as the Consul General, and subsequently the U.S.-South Africa committees were established, which included improving trading relations and promoting the African Growth and Opportunity Act, the GOA. Uh, where I was in Sierra Leone, uh, the, the real problem was not so much uh, formal trading relationships, but the presence of a lot of uh, kind of hit and run exploiters, people who were taking diamonds out of the country, so-called blood diamonds and using them for short-term profit at, totally at the expense of the Sierra Leone pe people. And the United States certainly supported the Kimberley process, which has been an effort to regulate the diamond market and not have diamonds extracted from conflict zones and to monitor the, the um, uh, production and marketing of diamonds so that they really are only in countries that are at peace and where people are not being killed in the context of the illegal export of resources. So there's a real role for American diplomacy in uh, controlling the kind of trading that goes on. Well, this was before I was there, but Ambassador Perkins sort of led the way uh, to opening up the U.S. diplomatic dialogue with the majority of South Africans and beginning black South Africans and beginning to press the, the then uh, apartheid government uh, to uh, shift away, to agree to a political process which would open the way to democratic elections. So he kind of had a great deal to do with getting that started and the role afterward of Bill Swing, who was the ambassador when I was there, Princeton Lyman, his successor, and all of us at the embassy and the consulates worked hard to, uh, first of all, support that transition, secondly, to encourage the white population to accept this as an important transition, and thirdly, to uh, do what we could to dissuade the more radical elements who were promoting violence and trying to thwart the democratic election from uh, succeeding. And so we worked very closely at the time that I was there with the African National Congress, also with uh, people in the National Party who wanted the transition to go forward. And I think this was one of the real successes, first for the South African people and their leaders, especially Nelson Mandela, but also for the American government in supporting those efforts. Well, I, I was not there at the time, so I, I, I can't answer that very directly, but I mean, I know he met with a lot of leaders, that black leaders, of course, Mr. Mandela was still in, um, in Ficta first to present at that time. He'd been transferred from Mount Robin Island. But uh, there were a lot of contacts with other leaders, in, 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 not both at the national level, but at the local level and the regional level, and encouraging them to come forward. And I think 
you know, again, you'd have to ask him directly, uh, working also with the government to persuade them to alter their approach. Of course, this only happened when, uh, uh, when uh, F.W. de Klerk became the president uh, in early 1993, which was about six months before I went out there. Well, I, I think that uh, diplomacy, and especially multilateral diplomacy, is key to the future of American interests in the world. And I think it is under-supported, under-financed by the Congress. And, uh, and, you know, the United States put something on the order of 500 to 600 billion dollars a year into the Pentagon and something on the order of 40 billion dollars into the budget of the State Department which includes foreign assistance so it's about 10 to 1 but there are almost no issues in the world that can be solved by military means none that can be solved by military means alone so there's really an urgent need to strengthen our diplomatic core. This is not only about money, but recognizing the importance of diplomacy as against this, you know, continuous focus on beefing up military security. Well, as you know, next week is the U.S.-Africa Summit in Washington, D.C., and President Obama is bringing all the leaders of Africa there. Uh, Michelle Obama yesterday spoke to a forum promoting the very high importance of education for African girls and women. You know, the, the African continent is something on the order of a billion people. Uh, and I think we have both uh, a political interest, an economic interest, and a humanitarian interest in seeing the continent transcend its conflicts, of find a way to promote development, above all, focus on education, getting girls, above all, to be literate and go to school so that they can participate in the political process, and ultimately to shift African political leadership from kind of one-party states or semi-authoritarian governments to democratic governments, which is a core principle of U.S. foreign policy. And this will be really important for Africa. Uh, and the United States can play a role. It won't do it by itself. In fact, the Africans have to take the lead in all of this. And we've here at IPI been hosting uh, 10 young African leaders of the future. And it's that for a month here how the UN works. And in my view, it's that next generation of Africans who are about 20 to 30 years old right now who really are the future of the country, of the, of the continent. So we need to support them in a big way, give them education, give them opportunities. Well, I, I think there is what I would call a systemic crisis in the Middle East right now, by which I mean uh, that states are kind of unable to control their own internal situation. Borders no longer have the same significance. So whether it's Syria or Iraq, uh, these, the, the, the conflicts within those countries transcend the borders of those countries. And the governments in each case, in Damascus and Baghdad, have demonstrated that they are unable to stop the violence. So we have the rise of ISIS now in Iraq, which is also bleeding into Syria. Um, so we're sort of at an impasse right now, it seems to me and the state system of the Middle East is imploding from within. Most of the leaders of the Middle East are uh, either authoritarian or semi-authoritarian in the Arab world, and they've really failed, in my view, to provide 
not only an answer to the point I've just made to you, but to provide education, development. It's all been based on oil and so on, you know, and just selling their, their natural resources. But they've not developed the capacity of their people to govern. So there's a crisis of governance, there's a crisis of national identity, there's a crisis of the collapse of borders. The Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916-18 created Lebanon and Syria. It's all disintegrating. Uh, so that these are huge challenges for American diplomacy. And I think people, the people who study these issues need to understand the underlying systemic crisis. So I don't think it's just Shia Sunni. I think it's much more than that, as I've just tried to explain to you. Well, I think the phrase Arab Spring was a misnomer, and I think, again, I don't believe any of the African leaders utilized that phrase. It became a kind of a Western phrase, and I think it was very premature to make these judgments. There's a tendency in the media to rush to judgment and kind of make sort of pronouncements of all these ostensible changes. And of course, much of this has come to very bad ends. So Libya is virtually without a state. Uh, Egypt is back to a semi-authoritarian state system where CLCC is not very different from President Mubarak. So whatever all these students had in mind has not come to pass. Uh, Tunisia has some possibilities, but it's a very small country, and most of the others, Saudi Arabia, UAE, so on, Jordan, are, are sort of monarchies, semi-authoritarian or authoritarian. So I think there's been much less change than uh, had been anticipated at the time. And I think one has to be very careful not to jump to these kind of sweeping judgments. Well, you know, the, the civilians who were there, as I told you, we were about 20 of us. It was a very, very small number. And uh, we were there in a, in a certain kind of crisis, a humanitarian crisis that had been sort of created by a civil war. And I think there was a feeling among the 20 of us, uh, 25 of us, and with the military led by General Robert Johnston, I was his advisor, as well as the advisor to Ambassador Oakley, uh, that we were there at an, imp at an important moment and that we could you know, begin to make a difference. It wasn't in our power to change this whole thing, but we tried to, you know, first of all, ease the, the humanitarian crisis, which I think we did by opening up the food corridors, and give the Somali people an opportunity to build a different state after uh, um, 22 years of rule by Siad Barre. So it was a kind of, a, there was a lot of, you know, camaraderie to use that kind of phrase. And it, also we didn't get much, happily Washington kind of let us do our own thing. And we didn't get a lot of direction out of Washington. And it, that kind of worked very well. So the diplomacy on the ground, Ambassador Oakley was just phenomenal in convincing all these people to stand down. Of course, this didn't last, as you all know, because by uh, after Black Hawk Down, which was long after I, I, he and I had left, the United States pulled out completely, which was a tremendous setback. And I think uh, I think this was a real failure of the international community and of the United States to withdraw from Somalia afterward. And a dozen years of withdrawal led to the rise of al-Shabaab and to the situation that now persists. And it's only since 2007 that the international community, with the support of the U.S., has begun to come back. So there are new opportunities for Somalia, but there were opportunities then that were to some extent available, and there are new opportunities now. Well, 
you know, there certainly is this new technology, and a lot of my course now, at Columbia on diplomacy, has to do with how do you function as a diplomat in the era of Google and Twitter and Facebook. But the um, you have to be more alert to the fact that tens of thousands, if not millions, of people know what's going on in the world, and it can't just conduct diplomacy in secret. But th th there's no. Um, alternative to having people there in each country directly interacting not only with the government of the day but with the people in those countries because you can't get that out of Google and Facebook or just sort of devices to show you what's going on but they're not instruments of knowledge or understanding I mean, there's a lot of there's big to my mind there's a huge difference between information which is what all these things provide, and understanding and knowledge and insights, which they don't provide, because they cannot provide. And the daily news cycle often doesn't provide them either, because it just gives you the tip of the ice, you know, today this happened or yesterday. But we really need, you really need people who understand these situations. And the only way to understand these situations is to be present for a substantial amount of time and develop relationships. You can't just fly in and fly out, which is also what the daily news cycle people do. They just go in and out. So that, you know, you get the superficial perception. Things are going badly. Well, okay, but what are you going to do about it? What are the root causes? And what can be done in a more fundamental way to address the root causes and have a more sustainable path to peace and development that that's kind of, so that's where i think diplomacy and the un come in